today's spreecast. I'm very, very excited about this session. Um, uh, so we're going to be basically talking about American Sniper and uh, there's been a whole lot of, of debate that has been inspired by this film and it's been controversial. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to, to get into that but first of all I will introduce myself, introduce Sheldon and then explain how to use Spreecast for those of you who haven't used it before. So my name is Naomi Brockwell, uh, I'm a producer at the Moving Picture Institute and I also work with Liberty.me, uh, I host the live academy at Learn Liberty, um, I work with a bunch of different uh, free market organisations and think tanks and very much involved in, in the freedom movement. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be here uh, with Sheldon right now. He's uh, just the most wonderful person, has uh, so much, uh, uh, so many credentials behind him. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Sheldon Richmond is Vice President of the Future Freedom Foundation. And those of you who don't know what the Future Freedom Foundation is, it's an organization that promotes an un uncompromising case for libertarianism in the context of both foreign policy and domestic policy. So that is very much linked into what tonight's debate uh, discussion is going to be about. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic organization that advances freedom with a moral and economic case for individual liberty, free markets, private profit, property and limited government. Uh, so Sheldon was the editor of The Freeman, he's the author of many, many books. He's published in too many journals to mention and too many newspapers. And he is a senior editor at the Cato Institute and the Institute for Humane Studies. So I am absolutely delighted to have him here to you know, share, share his expertise with everyone. Uh, so uh, can, can everyone hear me? Apparently my audio is a little bit choppy. If you want to go to the chat box, you can like type in and let me know how it sounds to you. Anyone? Hi, Josh. Can everyone hear me okay? The audio is coming through fine. I'm going to presume it is. Sounds fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, how Spreecast works. I'm not sure. Uh, who's used it before, um, whether this is your first time, but there are question boxes where you can submit questions. So I really encourage you to submit as many questions as possible because we want this to be a really engaging forum. And I will field those questions uh, to Sheldon as we go and make sure that we make this a really interactive and in-depth discussion because it's such a fantastic topic. So um, if everyone, oh, and, and just mind the noise, I do live in New York City, so it is going to be uh, a little bit noisy, lots of sirens and in the background, you come to expect that. Um, so yeah, let's dive straight into it. So uh, Sheldon, you wrote an article that you published on Liberty.me that sparked a whole bunch of rebuttal and agreement and disagreement. Can you please just summarize briefly what your article was about and your viewpoint when it comes to uh, tonight's topic? Uh, is the American sniper a hero? Uh, I'd be happy to. Thank you uh, very much for uh, putting this on, arranging this. Uh, very nice to uh, work with you, Naomi. Uh, yes, that article got quite a bit of, uh, of uh, comment, uh, pro and con. I've heard from many people who were not too happy with what I wrote yeah. over Twitter and personal email uh, and uh, Facebook. And so uh, I touched a nerve. And as I say in the piece, if, if uh, Clint Eastwood's movie sparks a discussion of war and heroism in the context of war, then uh, I think he's performed a real service for uh, the American people, but also maybe the people of the world. Uh, I didn't do a movie review because I had not seen the movie. The point was not to do a movie review, so I didn't judge Clint Eastwood as a director or the as the mo or the movie as a, a, a cinematic work of art. I wanted to talk about the question of whether uh, uh, Chris Kyle was a hero, and I don't, you don't need to see the movie for that. <clears throat> Uh, and I argued in that that he could not be construed as a hero. I saw many people just in black and white uh, tones uh, uh, declaring him a hero and not wanting to hear any uh, dissenting view on this. And I tried to lay out that given uh, the context of, that, of the war in Iraq, which, is a, which was a war of aggression by the United States against a country that had, or a government that had not uh, threatened the American people, in fact, was one time an ally. Uh, Saddam Hussein was an ally of the of the, of the American government for uh, for years. Uh, and, and so since it, they had never attacked the U.S., never threatened to attack the U.S., had nothing to do with 9/11, which a lot of people don't seem to know, judging by the emails I got, uh, that you can't declare Chris Kyle a hero on the grounds that he was saving American 
military men and women's lives in Iraq. In other words, it's like the old, they say in the law, uh, the fruit of the poison tree is also poison. So anything that happens after a launched war of aggression by the United States, what happens in the country where the war is going on can't be construed as heroism because he's saving people that should not have been there, that were that were in themsel themselves aggressing against the Iraqis. Kyle didn't know who he was shooting. He was shooting, uh, you know, uh, military-aged men, a very broad category. He called them savages, but many of those people were just defending their homes from a from a uh, an outside invading army. They were not Al Qaeda for the most part. There was no Al Qaeda in, in uh, Iraq before the United States invaded and decapitated the government by uh, overthrowing Saddam Hussein. So I think that gives you a, enough of an idea what the, what the article was about, and I'd be happy to uh, elaborate as we go along. Right. So, I mean, what were the main disagreements that people had in the comments? Because the, the comments, there were dozens and dozens of, of comments in both articles. You wrote two different articles. One of them was a follow-up to the first. Um, so, what were the main disagreements that, that people had about the article? Well, the second article was uh, precipitated by a lot of the comment because there was, uh, there was a line toward the end of the article, the original article, which I didn't mention just now in my little summary, which uh, people, if people read it will wonder why I left it out, uh, why I left it out of my summary. Uh, I compared, I said I did not see a, a, an essential difference, and, and I put the word essential in there because I think it's important, uh, between what Kyle did in Iraq and what Adam Lanza did at Sandy Hook Elementary School, which was, of course, that horrible school shooting mm -hmm. of, uh, what is it, two, two years ago or so, where this, this uh, you know, young man... Uh, walked into elementary school and just mowed down children and some teachers. A, a terrible, terrible mm -hmm. uh, incident, obviously. Uh, my, my point was not that there was no difference. I said there was not an essential difference. Well, that, that really made people angry. I think they would have been just as angry if I had only simply said that uh, Kyle was not a hero because that really touched the nerve. But right. uh, it certainly got a lot of people angry that I made this comparison. So the follow-up article is actually to defend that, mm -hmm. that comparison. Right. The original article was a 700-word article that was – you know, meant for newspaper op-ed pages, so that's about the limit, and I couldn't uh, uh, elaborate. Right. So the, the follow-up article uh, does elaborate. Right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and be so, so that... potentially controversial. Uh, so I, I posted something as well. Um, I loved the film. I absolutely loved it, but I am a film producer, so this is my, my industry, and I was judging it cinematically and all of that. Uh, that being said, you know, I agree with everything you said about Iraq and about America being an invading army, um, them being the aggressors. Uh, so it, but it really does uh, spark an interesting debate because, I mean, I, first of all, I might, I might pose the question, can any sniper be considered a hero? Because, I mean, the question tonight, we're not really talking about whether the film was historically accurate. We're not really talking about whether Clint Eastwood chose the right aspects of the war to focus on. Um, I, I didn't see the film as a... Um, uh, an analysis of the war at all. I saw it as a very personable tale, a character-driven uh, drama um, about someone who, you know, was was deeply, uh, um, uh, you know, hurt and affected by this very destructive force that is war. So, if anything, I found the film to be a case against war. Um, that these people went over there and then ended up with, you know, bordering on this almost schizophrenic state where you have to. You choose between protecting your family or protecting your country, and you know the way that it, the war was was uh, portrayed to these soldiers. It, it clearly the film showed how it was portrayed. It was portrayed portrayed as protecting America. You know, it came immediately after the Twin Towers collapsed. It was seen as you know America is under war. Um, and so that's what people were reacting to. I mean, we know in hindsight now it's just completely inaccurate. And generally the consensus, especially amongst libertarians, is that uh, Americans basically started uh, the aggression anyway. Um, but that's not really the, the issue. So tonight's question is, is the, was the American sniper a hero? Uh, and we know that Chris Kyle was referred to as a hero over and over again. Um, now, you, you argue definitely not because he's an aggressor. So I would ask, can any sniper in, in any war be considered a hero if they're good at their job? 
Oh, well, I can imagine a purely defensive war. Let's assume you live in a town and a, and a, 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 a foreign force. It could be foreign in the sense of a foreign country, but it could just be like another town that, ha that has a bunch of you know, aggressive people that want to come in and loot and pillage and kill. And so let's say they're right, bringing their forces into your town and, and you have a, 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 you know, like a volunteer militia, uh, not tax funded, of course, because it's a libertarian town. And uh, they they're well at, they're they're good at uh, defense. They they practice with guns because they realize that someday they may need to defend themselves. And so they take positions as uh, as this aggressive force comes rolling in. And and for the sake of the discussion, let's say we we have no doubt what their what the aggressive force mission is. Let's say they published it. Okay, they said we're coming to kill you all, and take your wealth. So we have no doubts. There's no moral ambiguity in this hypothetical. Uh, it seems to be a, a sniper there would be uh, justified. It would be self, simply self-defense or defense of innocent life. Right. You're a libertarian believes, uh, unless you're a total pacifist, you, you, it's, it's okay to use a physical force, deadly force, in defense of yourself or uh, uh, innocent life. So uh, I, I, you know, I can't maintain the position that uh, a sniper per se, cannot be a hero. You have to look at the surrounding right. uh, circumstances. So let me, um, let which me, is what I tried to do in my piece. Let me try to play devil's advocate here. So libertarians are very concerned with national borders. A lot of libertarians don't believe that um, certain nations have the right um, and that certain national borders are uh, should be recognized, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, how do we differentiate between people that we're allowed to save and people that we're not allowed to save? So let's say that um, there was a sniper in Nazi Germany. It was, there was an American sniper in Nazi Germany. So let's say that Germany never invaded America, um, but an American sniper went over there and started killing off Nazis. Would that be okay? Or because it's a sovereign nation outside of America, would it not be okay? And in that case, um, why is a national boundary so important when you have a country filled with people being being persecuted? Well, it's not so much that the national boundaries are important. It's that the uh, if you're stuck with a government, uh, as we as we are, uh, and unfor I'll add, unfortunately, uh, then it's it behooves you the, the people that have to live under it to keep it on as uh, to use Admiral J. Knox uh, term to keep it on as short a leash as possible, because when the government has a lot of discretion in foreign affairs and war making, uh, it gets the people it's supposedly protecting uh, in trouble. It creates enemies, it provokes enemies. We're, we've been seeing that with Iraq mm -hmm. and uh, Afghanistan and others, uh, uh, Pakistan uh, uh, these days. Yeah. So it's not so much that the uh, sovereign nation needs to be respected. I mean, my position is uh, I don't believe in sovereign nations. I don't believe in borders in that sense, yeah. but I still want the government on a very, very short leash as long as we have it. So that, that's how I would answer that. If a private American wants to, paying his own way, taking his own responsibility, you know, wants to go help a beleaguered people who are clearly victims of aggression, uh, as, as some people did during the Spanish-American War, there was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. We famously, uh, we always like to refer to that mm -hmm. as a famous thing. Uh, if it's totally private, that, and, of course, they're responsible for their actions. If they shoot the wrong people, they should be liable for that. Right. They shoot innocent people. But they, they, the government shouldn't stop them from, from going from going over there. Right. So uh, uh, I don't think you can justify Kyle's actions on that, because, uh, on that basis because he didn't go over on his own and accept responsibility. He was following orders. He joined the military. Objectively speaking, the military is the tool of the American empire. There's no two ways about, around that. And they may, you know, his defenders may say he took an oath to support the Constitution, defend the Constitution, but that's not what he does in practice. What he does is he goes where the president sends him. Right. And as one of his defenders on Fox News put it, he knew who the enemy was. The enemy was the, were the ones, this is what Jeanine Pirro said, he, the enemy that he went to kill were the ones the, government's told, the government told him to go and kill. Right. That doesn't sound like a principled person who's going to avenge... Uh, uh, innocent life. Right. Well, I mean, that by the way, I saw the movie. Up... This, I did see the movie. I saw the movie this afternoon, oh, yeah. and I am not a movie expert, so you may, I, I didn't think it was a great movie. Oh, really? I don't think I'm here being biased. 
I just didn't. It didn't grab me. It wasn't a fantastic movie. I think it was a. If it was completely fiction, I don't think it would be getting nearly the attention it's getting. Right. I. I, uh, I but mean, there's one um, key moment. I, I. I just wanted to bring up uh, something that you're just talking about when you're talking about people who are under orders going into other countries. So that was another point that people were bringing up uh, when they were commenting, responding to your article. Uh, they were asking, you know, if someone is just under orders, does it justify their actions? And if he went over there with the mindset of America is being attacked, um, you know, uh, Iraq, they are the aggressors, they shot down, you know, they, they crashed planes into the Twin Towers, and I'm there retaliating and protecting my people. Uh, do you think that there's a justified argument in that? Well, first of all, Iraq didn't knock down the two. No, no, I, I mean, that's, there were no that's, Iraqi but that's, that's right. irrelevant because so he, the story that the mainstream media definitely put out there was Iraq did this, now we're retaliating, this is our answer. So under that premise, um, well, someone, Chris Kyle. I was, reading, I, was, I was reading challenges to that claim, so he was capable of reading challenges to that claim, had he been curious. Apparently he was not curious about well, that. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that seems like an unfair argument. So I, I'm from Australia, as you can tell. Uh, I don't have an American accent. And, um, you know, when all of that happened, there was absolutely no doubt. Uh, all over the mainstream media, it was Iraq uh, that did it. Uh, when, you know, when the axis of evil was declared um, and when America declared war uh, against Iraq, it was, it was, I mean, it was very clear that that came as a uh, corollary of the Twin Towers and that it was Iraq that was responsible and that, you know, we were so trusting of American intelligence, which told us that it was Iraq. So and it's unfair to say, oh, but there was information on the internet that said otherwise, because, I mean, there's information on the internet well, that tells you that if you have a diet of just air, it's, it's really healthy. Like, you can find anything, you can make up any argument and you can find something on the internet to justify it. So that, that's an unfair statement. I don't think so. I, let me defend it. Okay. Let me defend it. First of all, Bush and Cheney did not prominently, their main argument for going to war in Iraq was not 9-11. They, they mainly made it about the WMD and, right. and Saddam Hussein's alleged lack of cooperation mm -hmm. with UN inspectors. Uh, they only left the impression that 9-11, that, that Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11. They didn't say, here's why we're going to war, they were involved in 9-11. By then, everybody knew that most of the uh, hijackers were Saudis. Mm -hmm. I think the balance, there was a couple of Egyptians and maybe there was one or two others. Nobody from Iraq. So they were not saying forthright, up, up front, here's why we're going to a war, 9-11. They said, WMD, he's got WMD, there's going to be mushroom clouds, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Al Qaeda was not in Iraq at the time, and no one claimed it was. So I don't think it was quite that obscure. And I'm not asking that uh, Kyle go, you know, look at obscure uh, websites to f find out the truth. Uh, he he just, you know, let himself believe that they were they were involved in 9/11. There's a key, you know, the, the other thing that people raised against me was that, you know, you, okay, you, sorry, you raised the the point of, and they as they did about uh, falling orders. Mm. It's funny that most of my critics who said this, or all my critics, said this without any hint of irony. <laughs> that that defense was not accepted at Nuremberg after World War II, and it's it's laughed at, right? If a if a German on a TV show says I'm only following orders, right. that's meant to be a laugh line because nobody buys that, right? And yet we buy it in the case of America. Well, I mean, it's certainly true that so what about this cow did not make the policy. So what about, let's say that um, you live in North Korea, and again, just playing devil's advocate, um, I'm, I'm completely on, on board with you, um, but let's say you're in North Korea, and your entire life you've been led to believe that Americans are the scum of the earth, and that they bombed North Korea, and that they destroyed it, and it's because of them that there's hunger. Um, and let's say that then they invent this scenario and say, oh, well, you know, it is probably Americans who did this other nasty thing. Let's go and attack them so that they can't keep doing it. Now, would a person in North Korea be held responsible for being an aggressor and starting an attack against someone in America? Uh, yes, and here's why. Uh, one of the founders of the modern libertarian movement, Leonard Reed, mm -hmm who founded the uh, Foundation for Economic Education, where I worked for 15 years, wrote, wrote a moving essay 
during the Korean War. He wrote it during the Korean War. It was republished in the 80s, I believe, by Fee, called Conscience on the Battlefield. And it's a, it's a, it's a conversation between an American GI in Korea who's lying on, uh, you know, uh, on the ground dying, and his conscience is speaking to him. And the soldier is saying, you know, I, I was following orders. It was a good cause. The government sent me here. Uh, basically saying, I'm not responsible for the people I killed. And the conscience is saying, no, you're wrong. You're always responsible for your actions. And uh, when you meet your maker, you're going to have to uh, own up to it and be accountable. You can't claim, no, I was sent here by somebody else. And I, I think that's true. So that would be true of the North Korean as well. He yeah. shot innocent people. I mean, it's an interesting uh, situation, though, if you take it down to the level of just the individual. Let's say that there was no government uh, at all. Let's say that there's some kamikaze pilot in North Korea who goes out on his own and says, listen, uh, the government doesn't seem to be doing anything. They're not stopping these awful Americans who are you know, creating mass starvation in our country. I'm going to take it upon myself and I'm going to go and bomb them as an individual. Would that person who his entire life has had um, has been brainwashed and had no freedom of, of information um, should he be held accountable if in his mind you know he thought that he was correct because of the information that that he was available to him well okay you, you, so the hypothetical of course is very extreme right course, you're saying he's course. in a totally controlled it's society where it's, he can I mean, have no access but of course I'm not you know Whatever answer I give, I'm not sure how, it's, how it applies to Chris Kyle. Either answer. Uh, I, you're trying to make it so he has zero information from any source but the official source, and he's only but getting a lie from I'm the still official source. Uh, <laughs> uh, I still don't see how it's relevant to Kyle. Uh, I'll explain that. Maybe we'd say that's a mitigating. Okay, I would. I would say it's a. It would be count as a mitigating circumstance, and it would get figured into, you know, perhaps the penalty. Okay. Would he still have to? Would he still owe restitution? I think he would still owe restitution under a strict liability standard. Look, Murray Rothbard used to use the example of he what he called the Lone Ranger principle. So you have this situation, right? We see Kyle drawing a bead on some Iraqi. He doesn't know who this Iraqi is. This could be someone defending his town, or it could be some agent of uh, Bin Laden. He doesn't know. Who, he doesn't have a resume on these people. He it's military military age person. He's aiming at him. Now the Lone Ranger in Rothbard's uh, story, is looking down on this situation. He's the objective avenger of justice, right? He, he, he's just watching the situation, and he, but, but he knows who's the aggressor and who's not. So who, does he, who will he uh, shoot down or interfere with while Kyle is aiming at an Iraqi kid or, or an Iraqi woman or just an Iraqi guy uh, you know, on the street, even if he's holding a grenade with an invading army? I think Rothbard would say, and I would agree, that he would strike down the American sniper because he's the, he's the aggressor. He's there where he doesn't belong. He's the away, away team, right? He's the visiting team, not the home team. Right. And I think that's how you have to look at it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I it is a really interesting um, situation. And it's also very interesting that a, a lot of my friends were very upset when um, when Bin Laden was uh, was captured as well because America went into a sovereign nation and um, and shot someone on someone else's soil and they thought that that was just not on um, because it's an aggressor as you said you know someone going into a, a different country um, but it does bring up some interesting issues so the reason I made that very obscure very unfair hypothetical um, I, if if you're in a position where you're not a libertarian and the information you've been given your whole life is that the government um, uh, the, the government is a good thing. The government has authority and moral authority. They're looking out for your best interests. I mean, this is indoctrinated into all of us. I know, you know, MPI has a great film called Indoctrinate You. Basically, it looks at the schooling system. And I mean, it's libertarians are looking at this from a very different perspective. Most of us are very well read uh, in all kinds of, you know, economics and, and political philosophy. Um, but for the average person, I mean, it's taken as a given that the government is giving you accurate information, the government is looking out for your best interests and all of that. So, you know, someone coming from Chris Kyle's perspective, where he he doesn't see that 
it's bad for, for, for a government to uh, act on the people's behalf. You know, a libertarian, as you said rightly, um, if an individual were to go and do that, it would, it would be okay because the responsibility would, would rest on them. But for a government to do that, it's not. And I completely, I'm completely on board with that. For someone who, who's yet to be enlightened about that idea, and then they're coming from a very different standpoint. So I do see how people who commented to your argument, I, I do see where their vitriol is coming from, even though I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, because Chris Kyle is probably coming from a place where he thought what he was doing was right. Uh, he trusts his government. The government says, go do this thing. And he has this, you know, ingrained belief that there must be something substantial backing that up. I mean, like, I remember when WikiLeaks first came out and there was this divide between people who said, listen, WikiLeaks is awful because there are some things that the public shouldn't know. And other people were saying, no, transparency is very good. What is the government trying to cover up? So I know that a lot of people are uh, were under the impression, and that's changing uh, now, the tide's changing, but people were under the impression more and more um, back in the day that, that the government had access to all of this information that we didn't know, so we should trust them because they, they're in a better position to judge whether something is, is right or not. So it's, it's just an interesting situation. Well, let, me, let me mention something here. I'll call, I'll call a very unlikely witness to defend my case. Uh -huh. Taya Kyle. Okay. This is Kyle's wife. You know, there's a key moment, and I think it may be the key moment in the movie that I've never seen anybody mention, including libertarians. And I've talked to people and I've read stuff. There's a key moment where I think he's getting ready to go back on his third tour, possibly the fourth, but third tour. And he, she says, why? Mm -hmm. Right? He's got one kid. I think there's another on the way. He's been very, home very little in the preceding couple of years. She says, why are you going back? And he says, I'm doing it for you. And by you, I take that she's sort of a microcosm for America, right. not just for her personally. She said, you know what she says? You'll remember, you saw the movie. Right. She says, no, you're not. Now, that, there's an average woman who probably didn't have a lot of skepticism toward her government. But she could see that he was not defending her and therefore the, the, uh, the, the country. He had some other personal issues. That he was, he wanted to be there rather than here. You know, it's like a person who says, look, I don't have time to work on my family. I have important things to do. I got to go fix Iraq. Yeah. You know, when somebody says something like that, and he was saying that with his actions, you get suspicious. Yeah. Because he's not going to fix Iraq. No matter how many people he kills, he's not fixing Iraq. But what, what's he leaving behind? And she saw through it. And I think that's very, very significant. Yeah. It doesn't take a libertarian who's reading all kinds of websites to figure out what's going on. She saw right through it. Yeah, no, I, and nobody's talked about that. I'm very surprised. Well, that's actually why I love the film. Uh, so that's, I mean, it, sort of going on a bit of a tangent here. Um, but I, I wrote a, just a post on Facebook that, that got a lot of comments from people and, again, a lot of vitriol. Um, because I said that I thought it was a great film. And I liked it because for me it was a film that was against war. You know, I, I very much saw the destructive force that war was. I very much saw, um, you know, in the suicide note that uh, his friend wrote. No, it wasn't a suicide note, sorry. The, um, the note that he wrote, the letter, and that they read out at the funeral, where it very much talks about, like, why are we still here? It's almost like this is just inertia. We're just keeping going, and there, there's no reason. Like, I, I actually really loved the uh, issues that it brought up and that it questioned. I loved the fact that, you know, his wife was a great character, who really did bring another side to this and really did highlight that um, that war well, was a destructive force. Uh, ever since the first tour, he came back and he was not the same. He had post-traumatic stress disorder. Almost, it bordered on schizophrenia. Um, and it, it, you know, uh, he probably had a, a mental illness um, that made made his perception of the situation so warped that he he somehow thought that the right thing to do was to go back to Iraq, when clearly, as you rightly said, uh, the wife saw things a lot more clearly and said, you know, you're, whatever reasons you're creating, uh, it's not factually accurate. It's, that's not the reality. The rea reality is you're doing this for, for other reasons. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I really liked the, the film because I, I thought that it explored those issues well. Um, now, so, I mean, we've got, got a couple of questions here now that I'd love to, to ask you. Um, so what is your take on preventative wars? For instance, if a country was threatening to acquire and use nuclear weapons. 
Now, first, before you go into that, I just love the idea that, you know, <laughs> it's taken for granted in society today that some people are allowed nuclear weapons, but others aren't. And who's the person who decides that? Like, that's, a, that's an issue in itself. But, whoops, my computer is, like, falling off. No, you're right. Uh, it's funny, we're negotiating with Iran, which has never had a nuclear weapons program, and uh, people can read Gareth Porter's book, mm -hmm. Manufactured Crisis, to see the, pr the proof of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, forces against our negotiation with Iran over a non-existent nuclear weapon is Israel, which is a, the nuclear monopolist in the Middle East and has been with something like 400 warheads on land, uh, air and sea. So, but they, get to your question. Look, you could come up with difficult, we could talk about difficult hypothetical situations uh, uh, all, all night. Uh, so you can imagine, yes, one uh, one gang has nuclear weapons and is threatening to launch uh, you know, if if someone's holding a gun at you but hasn't yet pulled the trigger, you're not obligated to wait until the trigger is pulled. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. You're allowed to repel a real threat, and uh, if, it, if it turns out you've kind of manufactured the threat, then you should be accountable for your actions. But uh, I think that sort of gets to your question. But see, the problem when questions like this come up uh, in the context of a, a U.S. foreign policy or foreign policy in general, we kind of forget we're talking about governments yeah. with all the perverse incentives the governments have. You know, people will talk about the bully in the schoolyard. They'll say, what do you mean? How can you be a non-interventionist? If there's a bully picking on someone, aren't you allowed to go over and defend the poor, the poor kid who's getting picked on? Well, of course you do. But my question is, what's that got to do with states and governments? I mean, we got to remember public choice and all the reasons we, we are skeptical of giving governments great leeway. Right. And this, that's the main answer, not can you come up with some hypo hypothetical situation where someone's aiming a nuke at you and can you act? Of course, of course, just like if someone's holding, getting ready to point a gun at you, you don't have to just wait until the bullet's leaving the, cha the, uh, the, the muzzle. So yeah. no, I completely agree. I think that really distracts us distracts us from the from from the actual subject. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And it's this idea that um, you know, a select few can represent an entire nation of people and wage war on their behalf. Um, that, I mean, that's astounding to me. That's why, I'm, speaking of monetary policy, I'm very much against the Federal Reserve because really all it enables is a country to go and wage war without having to get permission of the people it's meant to represent. And what happens then is if you have, you know, ostensibly a group of people attacking someone else, then that group of people is going to attack all of the other people who, who may not necessarily have had anything to do with it, may not agree with it, you know, have uh, are the unfortunate circumstances of being born into a country that was just very aggressive and wanted to wage war. You know, we, we don't get a choice of where we're born, unfortunately, which is why this nation state system is just um, a really, really bad one, because we're born into a situation that we really don't have much control over um, and immediately become subject to whatever laws that the people who, who rule it uh, create. Um, so right, and what goes along what goes along with that is na is nationalism, and that's the idea that we're, and especially with the, the United States, given its history, we're right. Anything we do is right, and this is actually the subject of my most recent article that was posted today, uh, called uh, "States, United States, America's James Bond uh, uh, Complex." <laughs> we, we have the double. we we have the double O. Right. America has the license to kill. We can do that. When I say we, I mean, the government yeah. can do things that other governments are not allowed to do. And, and you see this in the reaction to my criticism of Kyle. He was an American. We don't need to look too closely. That's all we need to know. He was killing non-Americans and he was an American. I don't. What else do I need to know? That was really the attitude I was getting from people. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, someone, uh, Ted Hux has asked, what is your definition of a hero? That's a great question. You know, I guess I know it when I see it, and I, and I know I'm not looking at one when I'm not looking at one. <laughs> uh, look, I don't know. It would take some time to formulate a careful definition that I could defend. I think we have a sense of what a hero is. It's a hero who's doing something uh, that we regard as good and virtuous uh, and uh, overcoming uh, difficult obstacles. In other words, it's something difficult to do. I think that's part of the element. But it's also something we regard as virtuous and moral. Yeah. I have, I have a definition not just here for brave, you. It's not just bravery. You, you can be brave and courageous, or certainly brave, in, in the commission of heinous crimes, right? You could be take, undertaking great risks. You could be killed. You could be killed. 
uh, committing a crime, but you say, that's all right, I want to commit this crime, I'll take the risk, I'm, I'm brave. So it's not just bravery in the action, you've got to look at the whole context of the action. I, I have a definition for you, um, which is, is apt considering the birthday which has just passed. Um, a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity and reason as his only absolute. I, um, I love that quote. Um, so we've got another question here uh, from, from Grant who says, for people who haven't seen the movie, do you recommend that they go see it for context or should we avoid it entirely? I think your answer is definitely going to be different. No, no, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't tell. Yeah, I wouldn't tell people to avoid it. Like I said, I wasn't blown away by it in terms of it being a movie. If it was pure fiction, so we didn't have these controversies. Right. You know, let's say they made up the names of countries and everything's made up. A lot of it is made up because, as we know, uh, Kyle was not actually loyal. You know, exactly loyal to the truth. We know that he's been caught in many lies, and so it's hard to know what to believe. And then, of course, Eastwood was making a movie, so he. He you know, obviously massaged things, but I just didn't think it was a wonderful, great, I didn't go out of it saying with my jaw dropped saying, wow, that was a powerful movie, great acting. I just, I didn't see it. Uh, it was less gory than I thought it was going to be. It was going to be. I don't really like grim, gory movies or that movies that depict great cruelty, mm -hmm. you know, one person or group being very graphically cruel to another. There's not a lot of that. There's a bit, but not enough where I was ready to shield my eyes. Okay, so it, it, I wouldn't. I would say people that are curious about this go go see the movie. I'm also reading the book. Yeah, I understand I wanna, his I own portrayal of himself book. in the book is a lot more negative than Eastwood. Yeah. See, well, one thing I'll give Eastwood credit for in this sense is it is a good movie. He he left us with something to argue about, right? When an art when a when a movie is so black and white that there's not even anything to argue about, right? The villain the villain or the hero whoever is just um, you know either totally all good without question or totally all bad without question, that's not interesting. And so who's going to talk about that afterwards? Nobody. Right. But See, a movie where the lines are a little fuzzy, and, and I'd be interested to hear your comment on this because you're, you're involved in film, where the lines are more fuzzy, then there's really something to discuss. Right. And, and none of us can say which is the right interpretation because maybe he wanted us to make our own interpretation. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's one of the things that really struck me is uh, that a lot of people think that in the film he, Chris Kyle is being portrayed as a hero. See, I, I reject that premise itself, uh, so, which puts me in an interesting position um, because there's so much subtext in this film where, I mean, everywhere he goes, Chris Kyle is called a hero. That doesn't mean that he's being presented in the, as a hero. You know, it'd be the same as me eating a piece of, of uh, charcoal and going, mmm, this is delicious. Like, clearly it's not delicious. You can tell that from my facial expressions, from the tone of my voice. So, I mean, yes, if you take what people were saying about Chris all through the movie, there were, you know, strangers were meeting him in the street and saying, you're a hero. People were celebrating him um, around the, the barracks. People were cheering him and making fun of him. And, you know, um, but... Chris Kyle, the the film version, uh, didn't buy into it. So he clearly was uncomfortable with that situation every time it came up. So for me, that already was questioning whether or not Chris Kyle was a hero. Otherwise, I feel that Clint Eastwood would have just been more black and white and portrayed him as this great guy who's mm -hmm. very humble um, but still celebrated. But he wasn't, you know. He was someone who came back and almost killed a dog because he you know, had, had this mental disorder that just made him so paranoid and almost schizophrenic. Uh, he was someone who, um, you know, it was he was under so much much pressure and and psychological damage from the war. I I don't feel that the movie portrayed him as a as a hero as such. Uh, there were too many questions that that were brought up through the, the film. Uh, I went and saw that film with my sister, and honestly, no joke, we came out of the film, and both of us had been crying. But I am a crier. I'm gonna, I'm gonna admit that. So uh, it do doesn't really say too much about the film. I'll, I'll probably cry in Harry Potter too. Um, but we came out of that film, and we're just like, oh my god, I, I have to get a beer. And we literally just went straight to the pub because we needed to decompress. And I think that it's because film is so powerful, but it's also so greatly informed by a person's context. So um, if you used to work as a clown and you went and saw like a scary clown movie, you're going to have a very different reaction to it than, a, you know, a different person. Uh, from my point of view, you know, I, I know a lot of people in special forces. Uh, I know a lot of people who, who, you know, whose relationships have been torn apart by war, by the psychological damage. I've 
in the character of Chris mm -hmm. Kyle. I've seen that very disconnected person. I've seen people change. I've seen their life just be taken, completely stolen from them. You know, I know people who come back from the Vietnam War who still stay awake at night and have awful, awful nightmares who, you know, run in their sleep and tear up bed sheets. And it's it's a scary psychological state that war puts you into. So for me, I mean, the movie just was so heartbreaking. It really tore me apart because you could just see this destruction in this character. And, you know, I thought Bradley Cooper was just gave a phenomenal performance. I, I really adore him as an actor. So for me, I found the, the movie very powerful. Uh, it wasn't so much like a black and white issue of was this war just? Is this person a, a, a hero or a villain? Uh, for me, the movie was just a really great in-depth character study um, of a person, could have been any person, who went away to war and came back destroyed. That, that's what the film represented for me. And I, I did mention that in, in my comment, um, the comment that I wrote, that for me, you know, I feel that people wouldn't have had such a strong response, exactly as you just said, Sheldon, uh, if it was set, you know, on another planet. If it was a sci-fi action movie, people probably wouldn't be asking these questions. But because it does portray itself as um, uh, non-fiction, people have a right to be a bit more critical of it because you're, you know, you're dealing with uh, well, we, we compounding don't, we factors. Don't, and it's hard to know. It's hard to know what's true and what's not true. First of all, we know that Kyle was a, a massive self-promoter. He made up incidents about his life, right? That he decked, uh, what's his name, Jesse Ventura in a bar. We know that didn't happen. Ventura won a defamation suit against against uh, his estate. He was dead by then, uh, uh, Kyle. Uh -huh. he, he made up a story that the police or the military, the government sent him to uh, during uh, Katrina to go on top of the Superdome and shoot looters. A lie. Zero evidence for this. No, no other. He, he claims he shot two carjackers. Uh, and called the police and waited for the police to come. Zero evidence for this. Yeah. The guy ma made stuff up. We know it. He's been caught in lies. His family, and, and I guess when he was still alive, claimed all the profits from the book were going to vets organizations. Mm -hmm. The National Review debunked that. They've made millions of dollars and only given, you know, tens of thousands to one of, to this group. And I'm not, I'm not saying how much they should have kept. Let them keep all the money, but don't lie about it. They didn't give six million dollars. Uh, the book proceeds uh, to charity. Right. So he's a self-promoter. A good friend of mine who has read the book and seen the movie and a very intelligent guy says that the Chris Kyle portrayed in the movie is much more sympathetic than the Chris Kyle in the book. Oh, definitely. Which is very interesting, right? Because the book, the book doesn't have Clint Eastwood as a mediator. Yeah. The book is, is Kyle talking to two authors. Now, I don't know how much the authors added. We see him in the movie hoping he does not have to shoot a child. Remember? Remember the child is about to pick up a uh, shoulder-launched gr grenade launcher that had been in the hands of an adult and uh, Kyle had shot. Now the thing's on the ground and a kid is going to pick it up, a little kid. And he's saying, don't pick it up, don't pick it up. In other words, if you pick it up, I'm going to have to shoot yeah. you. Don't pick it up. And the kid at first picks it up and Kyle's about to shoot him. The kid then drops the thing and goes away and he's relieved. In fact, he seems to cry. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I don't know if that ever happened. I don't know if that happened. I don't know if that's true. That might, I don't know if that's Eastwood, or I don't know if that, or maybe that's Kyle's imagination. So I can't say, oh, see, Kyle has this decency in him because I don't know if that's true. But it is in the movie. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up. We've only got like a couple of more minutes uh, before we go. I just wanted to say a couple of things on that note. Uh, so one of the questions here. Um, uh, is, you know, not to justify Kyle's actions or redeem him in any way, but should a man be considered a victim of the state? And I did think that too. I mean, the state really is this awful institution and uh, situations like this, this war really portrays how, how um, such awful institutions can make good people, otherwise good people do really bad things. Um, that, I mean, that should really shed some light on how bad <laughs> governments are when, when they can constrict, conscript people, when they can turn them into, into killers. Um, but on that note, I mean, if we're talking about We don't have conscription, just to correct one thing. I mean, we don't have conscription, so he was a volunteer. Right. No, but I'm talking in general. Governments do use conscription uh, to send people to war. So that reflects that the institution of, of government is not a good machine if it can do that to people. Um, so my question, I mean, well, my point would be if people are, can be somewhat victim of the, of the state in this respect, um, 
It was not really a question. I mean, I, I, I sort of want to draw people's attention to the fact that 8 million people, ex-army people, ex-officers, um, personnel, they kill themselves every year. I mean, that's tragic. That is more people than have died in all of Iraq and, and all of Afghanistan and all of these wars put together. Um, they kill themselves every year, 8 million every year. That, I mean, that for me is, is horrifying. And that's sort of why the film had such an emotional impact on me, because um, you, you really see a story of a, of a soldier that goes to do something and they think that it's right. I don't know whether it's because of context and we portray war as this glorious thing still um, or not and people want to go and fight in them or they create whatever justification is necessary. But the fact is people go off to war and, and their lives are completely destroyed and then they end up you know, not being able to live with themselves. Um, so that is definitely something to keep in mind when we are talking about uh, officers and, and whether or not um, you know, I know we talk a lot about individual responsibility and and these people are, are bad and we need to recognise that if they're going off and being aggressors in other countries. Um, but there is also a, a separate element to that and we do have to be mindful that um, of what these people are, are going through. So I just thought I'd, I'd bring that into the mix. And before we go, I mean, did sure, you have any, any closing uh, comments or, or anything related to that or, or not related to that? Well, I think I think you make a very good point, and it, I think we we can implicate the government schools in this. The government yeah. schools, in part, are dedicated to preparing people for that, right? To take orders, to believe the government when it says go over there because they're they're threatening us. They'll kill us if if we if they'll be over here if we don't go over there. Yeah. This, I think the schools are grooming people for that, uh, and and so we we shouldn't be surprised that the that people then respond that way that aren't they aren't skeptical why aren't they skeptical of what the government tells exactly. them, uh when, when it's time for war or any other time it's because they've been softened up and then of course most of the media certainly the major media shows no signs of skepticism either so that's the reinforcement from all sides so it kind of makes your point i agree Done. to some extent he is definitely a victim too He's a victim also. Yeah. I don't mind saying that. Yeah, well, I just, you know, we'll have to wrap it up here, but I really wanted to thank you, Sheldon. I think that people, I really encourage everyone to read what Sheldon has said, if you haven't already, uh, read the stuff that he has written about this issue. Uh, it's a really important issue, and I think a lot of people just don't realize um, what America's involvement in Iraq actually was. Um, I mean, I would argue that libertarians understand it more than, than most, but, um, but I really do encourage people to learn more about that and if anything as you said uh, rightly so if Clint Eastwood's film has done anything it's encouraged more conversations like this where more facts actually come out and we think about these questions we think about the role of government uh, we think about the monopoly of power and we we also think about the ability of a nation to wage war on an entire country's behalf these are important questions so um, thank you so much I know if um, so Sheldon works uh, mainly at the Future Freedom Foundation please go to their website have a look at the, what they do, a fantastic organisation. Um, I, I know Jacob uh, very well, the, the man who, who started that, and uh, it's just, they do really, really great work. So read the stuff that they put out, get on their mailing list, and um, thank you so much, Sheldon, for, for being here tonight. And thank, you everyone thank you very for, much. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining in. This has been really, really fun, and I, I hope to see you at the next one. So see you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.